Israel, a tiny country, a country that was and was not, and is born again, a promised land, a hated people, a stumbling block to the nations, a future world capital, Israel. Hello, and welcome to a New Covenant Fellowship Church broadcast. I'm Pastor Chuck Myers. Last week, I was speaking with a fellow about last week's broadcast on the Mark of the Beast, and our conversation turned to the country of Israel. The fact that Israel is where it is, when it is, today, screams that the Bible is true, that Bible prophecy is unlike anything that any other book in the world can boast. Let's examine our key text today. Genesis 17. And when Abraham was ninety years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am the mighty God, walk before me, and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked to him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations I have made thee, and I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee in their generations, for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession and I will be their God. The phrase everlasting covenant or perpetual covenant is used no less than 16 times in the Old Testament, plus once in the New Testament. God, the creator of everything, promised Abraham and his descendants the land that is today Israel to be their land forever. In the book of Matthew chapter 24, the Bible says this, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be here one stone up on another that shall not be thrown down. Listen, what Jesus was referring to was an event that happened in 70 A.D. History tells us, and you can Google this, that the Roman general Titus and his army destroyed Jerusalem and had the temple and buildings completely dismantled in the quest for gold and temple treasure. In fact, one place online puts it this way, Titus ordered Jewish deserters from Jerusalem to be crucified around the walls. By the end of July 70 A.D., the Roman army broke through the walls. The Jewish temple was so completely destroyed that only the foundation stones of the temple mount were left. This is exactly what Jesus prophesied in Matthew. There was a second Jewish revolt in A.D. 132-135, to a Jewish rebellion against the Roman rule in Judea. With the fall of Jerusalem and then Bethar, a fortress on the seacoast south of Caesarea, where Bar Kokoba was slain, the rebellion was crushed in 135 A.D. According to Christian sources, Jews were then henceforth forbidden to enter Jerusalem. From these two battles, the Jewish nation of Israel was no more. The Jewish people were scattered to the four corners of the earth, as it were. And here's something really amazing. Hundreds of years before the Jews were scattered, the prophet Ezekiel penned the following. In Ezekiel chapter 20, I will bring you from the nations and gather you from the countries where you have been scattered with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with outpoured wrath. And Isaiah wrote in chapter 11, In that day the Lord will reach out his hand a second time to reclaim the remnant that is left of his people from Assyria, from Lower Egypt, from Upper Egypt, from Cush and from Elam, from Babylonia, from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. He will raise a banner for the nations to gather the exiles of Israel. He will assemble the scattered people of Judah from the four quarters of the earth. So even before the Jewish nation was scattered abroad, God had promised to one day bring them back to the same land that they had been scattered in to begin with. So from essentially 70 AD, the nation of Israel was history. Mark Twain, throughout his book, Innocence Abroad, from his trip to the Holy Land, explicitly states that the area was desolate and devoid of inhabitants. 
His group entered Palestine from the north, passing through such sites as the Sea of Galilee, the Benais, Nazareth, Jenin, and Nablus. And listen to this. Riding on horseback through the Jezreel Valley, Mark Twain observed the following. He said, There is not a solitary village throughout its whole extent, not for thirty miles in either direction. There are two or three small clusters of Bedouin tents, but not a single permanent habitation. One may ride ten miles hereabouts and not see ten human beings. He continues, Of all the lands there are for dismal scenery, I think Palestine must be the prince. Can the curse of the deity beautify a land? Palestine sits on sackcloth and ashes. Over it broods the spell of a curse that has withered the fields and fettered its energies. In other words, Mark Twain, when he went to Israel and Jerusalem, said this is a wasteland. There's nothing here. It's no longer a country, not a nation. There are hardly any people here. And this was just in the 1800s. He wasn't alone in his poor impression of the land of milk and honey that we talk about today. Historians and travelers alike made similar dreary observations over the centuries. In fact, 600 years before Mark Twain's visit, another famous visitor by the name of Rabbi Moses ben Nakam fled Christian Spain for the land of Israel. And after a long and perilous journey, he arrived at the port of Acre before traveling to Jerusalem in 1267 A.D., where he couldn't even find nine other Jews to pray with. He wrote to his son, Many are Israel's forsaken places, and great is the desecration. The more sacred the place, the greater the devastation it has suffered. Jerusalem, he said, is the most desolate place of all. Folks, I want you to understand something today. Anyone preaching about much of Bible prophecy concerning Israel and Jerusalem from around 70 A.D. until 1948 had to preach it by faith because Israel, Jerusalem, simply did not exist. And there are so many prophecies that deal with Israel and Jerusalem in the end days that probably some people in those days before 1948 and after 70 A.D. really had a hard time grasping what they were preaching about because the country, the nation of Israel, had ceased to exist. That is, until Bible prophecy was fulfilled on May 14, 1948, when David Ben-Gurion stood in the Tel Aviv airport and made a declaration to the world. He said, Today, a nation is born, and its name is Israel. Since the declaration of Israel as a nation, they have been hated, attacked, and threatened by surrounding nations. In fact, the Arab-Israeli War of 1948 broke out shortly after the declaration when five Arab nations invaded the territory in the former Palestinian mandate. This was immediately following the announcement of the independence of the State of Israel on May 14, 1948. The young, fledgling Jewish nation was terribly outnumbered and outgunned, but somehow managed to defeat the oncoming armies in just three days. How do you suppose they did that? I can tell you how, because they still have a God that has a purpose for that nation. They have a God that made a covenant with Abraham for him and for his descendants. Again in 1967, the Six-Day War for Jerusalem, the Jewish nation again was victorious over the surrounding armies and regained control of the capital of Israel. Listen to what Mark chapter 24 says in verses 32 and 34. Jesus said, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. Likewise, when you shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass until all of these things are fulfilled. The fig tree Jesus used was an illustration of Israel. Jesus was saying, when you see Israel again become a nation, understand that this generation is the generation in which I will return. Listen, folks, this is now, our time, our generation. My grandfather and father were alive when the prophecy was fulfilled that Israel was to become a nation. I was alive in 1967, when Jerusalem was again taken control of by the nation of Israel. Some of you may remember when, in December of 2017, President Donald Trump moved our embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. In so doing, recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel a monumental declaration of prophetic significance, to say the least. So, you remember how earlier I shared that Mark Twain had said of Israel that the area was desolate and devoid of inhabitants. I want you to hear what the prophet Jeremiah prophesied about 600 years before Christ. Just as the nation of Judah was being destroyed, and the people were being taken captive to the land of Babylon, he spoke of a day when Jews would once again purchase land within the ancient territory. That is precisely 
what returning Jews started doing nearly a century ago. They bought back the land. Here's what Jeremiah said in chapter 32. Fields will be bought with silver, and deeds will be signed, sealed, and witnessed in the territory of Benjamin, in the villages around Jerusalem, in the towns of Judah, and in the towns of the hill country, of the western foothills, and of the Negev. Because I will restore their fortunes, declares the Lord. This is exactly what we have seen happen since 1948. Isaiah says again in chapter 66, Who has ever heard of such things? Can a country be born in a day? Or a nation be brought forth in a moment? Yet no sooner is Zion in labor than she gives birth to her children. Israel, a nation that had not really existed as a separate nation for nearly 1900 years, was declared a sovereign state by an act of the United Nations on May 14, 1948. Therefore, a nation was born in a day. Folks, this is exciting news. This is our lifetime. We are living in the end days. With the return of a nation, the ancient Hebrew language has been revived and become the official language of the state. Prior to this happening, the Jews spoke an impure form of the language called Yiddish. Remember, these people were scattered abroad. They were from all nations of the earth. Many of them had picked up foreign languages. But I'm here to tell you today that the return to a pure common language was again prophesied by the prophets. Listen to this, Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. For then will I turn to the people a pure language, that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve Him with one consent. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my suppliants, the daughter of my dispersed, shall bring mine offering. God spoke to Zephaniah, and he prophesied that one day, when the Jews had returned, God would return their native tongue to them, and that has happened in your lifetime and in my lifetime. The restoration of the agriculture and of the trees in the forest of Israel has been another remarkable miracle. Listen, scarcely 75 years ago, the land of Israel was a desolate waste, full of malarial swamps and deserts. Today, the replanted forests are flourishing, and the Israeli agriculture production is one of the great wonders of the world. This tiny country exports quality produce around the world. Can I say it again? Just as it was prophesied. Listen to this out of Isaiah 26. In days to come, Jacob, which is an, a name for Israel, will take root. Israel will bud and blossom and fill all the world with fruit. Google it yourself, folks. It's happening right now. Isaiah 35 says this, The desert and the parched land, that's what Mark Twain said, that's what he's seen, will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. That's exactly what we see in the land of Israel today. Romans 11:25, Paul says this, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. That is exciting. Today, Israel is a nation, and there, listen, there are uh, Messianic groups, Christians in Israel, but for the most part, Israel, by and large, is blind to the fact that Jesus Christ was their Messiah. And God said, it will be this way until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, until a certain appointed day by God, which is already set, when He comes back for His church, when that happens, and there's a designated point in time during the tribulation that all of Israel will recognize that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. And Romans 11 goes on to say the next verse, And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And verse 27, For this is my covenant unto them. Through Paul, God has reminded us that he has a covenant with Israel, and he will take away their sins. Listen, God is absolutely not finished with Israel. The church has not replaced Israel. Zechariah says in chapter 14, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. Did you hear that? Zechariah is prophesying in the last days God will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. Listen, folks, until 1967 this prophecy was impossible because there was no Jerusalem. Our president, three years ago, made a declaration that we as Americans recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. That is so significant to Bible prophecy. He goes on to say, And the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished. 
and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the remaining of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against these nations, as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave, or shall split in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. This hasn't happened yet, folks. There's going to be a great earthquake of some sort when Jesus comes down. This is during his second coming, not the rapture. And sets his feet on the Mount of Olives. It's going to split in two. And again, this prophecy would not have been possible until our time, 1967, our day and age. What an exciting message from God's Word today. What does it all mean? It means the Bible is verifiably true. That the return of Jesus is very near. He is about to come back for his bride, the church in an event known as the rapture. Are you ready? It means regardless of those who hate Israel, God still loves them as a people and as a nation. Regardless of those who say that God is finished with Israel, the scriptures declare otherwise. Regardless of those who believe the land belongs to the Muslims or the Palestinians or should be divided, God's covenant to Israel still exists today. It's not going to happen. It means regardless of those that seek the destruction of Israel, it will never happen, not completely, because the Bible declares otherwise. God's hand is still on Jerusalem. Christ will return to rule and reign from Jerusalem. And we, those that are in Christ right now, that become a part of His kingdom, will rule and reign with Him. The book of Psalms tells us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. The Bible says that, that Jerusalem one day would be a stumbling block to all the nations. That's exactly what we see happening today. Such a small, tiny country and yet the entire world is focused on Israel and Jerusalem daily. And I can tell you why, biblically, but that's for another sermon. Remember the nation of Israel today in your prayers, as they have a special place in God's end time planned, and that is in the near future. God's message to you today, we are in the end times. The return of Jesus Christ is very close, and there's so many signs we could go over today. But His message to you, if you've never made a commitment to Christ, is in found in John chapter 3, verse 16. It says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Won't you repent of your sins today? Receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. Just call out in prayer today. The Bible tells us this in Romans 3.23, For all and fall short of the glory of God. None of us are worthy. None of us will make it unless we call upon Jesus Christ. The Bible says there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved except the name of Jesus. No other religion, only Christ. The Bible says again in Romans 6.23, the wages of that sin that we all have is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. God the Father has made a way. It's a gift offered to you. And all you have to do is receive it. Follow Him and you will have an eternal residence in heaven. There is no other way. Hey, thanks for joining us again this week for another broadcast of the New Covenant Fellowship Church. And feel free to join us again next week as we break the bread of the Word of Life. I'm Pastor Chuck Myers.